and gentlemen. I have, first of all, to communicate the apologies of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Uluwatoni Ubundike, who is unable to be with us today because official duties have taken him out of town. I also have to communicate the apologies of the Chairman of the Board of Trustees, who happens to be the Vice Chancellor Designate, who is to resume office on the 12th of November, 2023. She together with the Vice Chancellor are attending an Africa regional meeting pertaining to higher education in Africa. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth Abimbola Aino Omolulu Mulele Annual Lecture with the title Fostering Research and Innovation in Obstetrics and Gynecology and women's health. Let me commence the speech by saying a very, very big thank you on behalf of the entire university community to late barrister Mrs. Frederica Abimbola Aino Omolulu Mulele for the institution and the sustainers of the annual lecture series, which we are having the fourth edition of today. As we all know, the goal of medical science, which obstetrics and gynecology is part of, whether as a field of research or as a field of practice, is to improve the quality of human life by providing the highest quality care for human beings. Human reproduction has been with humankind since creation, and much is known about the risks to life and health that are incidental to it. It is no surprise, therefore, that it has been an area of significant interest to medical scholars and practitioners over centuries, with a view to reducing those risks that attend it. While significant gains, gains have been made over time, such, as, such that mortality and morbidity is almost non-existent, in some parts of the world, the rates of these in some other parts remain high and unacceptable. Unfortunately, Nigeria falls into the class of those parts where the rates are high and definitely unacceptable. The statistics tell of a dire situation, and I know of no better person to give us the most current of these statistics than the current than the guest speaker of today. As the world acknowledges that reproductive health challenges remain severe and unacceptable, addressing it systematically and concertedly has been identified as a global priority. Hence, two of the sustainable development goals being pursued as we approach 2030 are designed to be responsive to the challenges. Specifically, goal two, which relates to good health and well-being, goal five, which relates to gender inequality. For us at the University of Lagos, we are committed to contributing our quota to meeting the relevant targets under these scope goals. It is for this reason that when we had the opportunity, we swiftly welcomed the donation and hosting of a specialized women's clinic, the CAF, the Kessintin Adepupola, Adebutu Foundation Medical Laboratory and Maternity Center, which serves not only women within our university community, but all of the Lagos community and beyond. I dare say we're probably the only, the only university campus or university system in Nigeria that has a maternity hospital and a women's clinic. In recognition of women's reproductive rights, aside the general obligations of the university to recognize the right to maternity leave, 
the University of Lagos adopted an employment of pregnant women policy more than five years ago. The policy prohibits discrimination based on pregnancy status for women about to be employed. Specifically, this policy allows women who are pregnant at the time that they receive their offer of employment to defer, to defer their resumption of duties amongst other things. Again, I dare say we're probably the only institution in the whole of Nigeria that has that in black and white. Indeed, today's talk is very apt and timely based on the fact that there is an urgent need to address the multi-pronged facets of reproductive health challenges that women face in Nigeria. As the topic indicates, I am sure we will learn lessons that we can translate into action. In closing, let me say that I am very glad at the choice of Professor Faide E. Okonokwa, who I have had the privilege of working with for more than 25 years in this field of reproductive health, even though I am just a lawyer. He is a distinguished scholar and pioneer vice chancellor of Undo State University of Medical Sciences and founder of the Women's Health and Action Research Center if not for profit making organization with headquarters in Benin. The erudite scholar whose career trajectory has seen him be not just a national leader, but a foremost global scholar and practitioner in the field of female reproductive health research and service provision. He is indeed the right man for today's assignment. Once again, I welcome you all and I join the board of trustees of the Abimbola Aigno Omolulu Mulele Annual Lecture Series in Obstetrics and Gynecology to invite you all to sit back and listen with very rapt attention to Professor Faide Okonofa, who as he serves us an enlightening diet of a thought-provoking lecture. Thank you very much. I am an Oliver Twist, who likes to ask for more. It won't be out of place if we give the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Development Services, Professor Ayodele Ashenua, another round of applause. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Sunday Omishaki. Well, um, if I want to go back to my department again, I have to recognize the presence of my big professors there, starting from my head of department, Professor B.B. Afolabi, Professor Anolu, and my guy himself, Associate Professor Olabi Dilo, and Professor Akala here too, a former HOD of and guy in Lassut, and the current HOD of Ops and guy in Lassut, Professor Kabiru Rabi, and, uh, and also my um, my team member, the, that we played the ball together in the unit, Dr. C.C. Mako. I recognize your presence, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have with us the Director of Finance. They are the most integral people. Dr. Simeon Akinadi, you are highly recognized, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Without wasting more time, we want to listen to the chairman of today's occasion, Professor Ade Tokumbo, Olushegu Fabanwo, FWACS, FICS, FNAMEDS, FAMEDS. A round of applause as he steps up for his opening remarks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I don't know why the MC tried to embarrass me by naming what to you are meaningless applications. But I thank him. The representative of the Vice Chancellor 
my long-standing associate and friend, Professor Ayo Ashenua, with whom we work in the abortion sphere. She's our lawyer. When she's with us, we feel protected that we will not be sent to jail. I welcome you, the provost of the College of Medicine, Professor David Waleoke, my worthy predecessor in office, a man that spent eight years of his career and life in Nikeja, helping us to sort out our issues and leaving us with a legacy that we are now building upon. I thank you, Wally. You are welcome. <laughs> Representative of the Advancement Office, the head of ONG department, which is the collaborating department for this event, Professor Aposede Afolabi. I welcome you and I greet you. The representative of the family and the donor, Dr. Bolaji Akerele, I welcome you. The guest speaker, Professor Friday Konofwa, also my friend, my long-standing associate, my professional colleague, my senior in the profession by only six months. <laughs> he passed his fellowship in May. I passed my own in November, the same year. But it's my senior. The representative of the dean, all distinguished obstetricians and gynecologists in the house, especially from Luth and Lassuth, and all representatives of SOGON, which is our professional body, I welcome you, distinguished guests, the school children that are here, I welcome you. I'm delighted to be here and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I believe that my delight was even enhanced when I knew that the guest speaker today was going to be my old medical school classmate and friend, and also a research associate and professional colleague, Professor um, Friday Okonofo. I want to congratulate the University of Lagos Office of Advancement as well as the Board of Trustees of the Abimbola Ino Omololu Milele Lecture Series. This obviously is a well put together event and clearly, to me, the organization is top notch. Can we give them a round of applause? It would appear, though, that my alma mater is a bit under focus today because when you look at the head of the department of obstetrics and gynecology, the collaborating department, she's an alumnus of my alma mater. The guest speaker, Professor Faide Okonofwa, is an alumnus of my I was expecting the incoming vice chancellor to be physically present, and I was going to boast about her also that she's an alumnus of my alma mater. So when this uh, Akoka and the Jaraba people start celebrating themselves and saying they are number one and this and that, remember that there are other universities that are us there. I, I want to say that this annual lecture was endowed with a generous song by late Mrs. Frederica Abimbola Aino Omololu Mulele, 
we are told that she was a scion of the Darosha Afoju dynasty in Lagos. She studied law and was a member of the Miro Temple in London. She subsequently established a renowned group of educational institutions which has endured till date, and I'm referring to the Adrao group of schools. At this juncture, I want to pray for the sweet repose of the soul of this wonderful woman. May the Almighty God continue to grant her eternal life. I am of the opinion that this singular gesture has a far reaching impact on the larger society. Apart from ensuring that we have high quality discourses on an annual basis on topics that are contemporary and relevant, it also brings together the town and the town, as you can see today, is exemplified by the plethora of people that are in this form. And the very wise choice of domiciling the endowment in the Department of Academics and Technology must have been because the donor had an insight into the many unresolved issues special, which incidentally has been used by some mysterious elements to describe our specialty as a specialty of diplomacy. My only wish is that a lot more high net worth Nigerians will be less myopic about the management of their country and put them to meaningful and purposeful use, either when they are still alive or when they are passed. Endowments of this kind in academic institutions will undoubtedly go a long way in advancing the frontiers of political education. Today's discourse centers around women's health which is a subject that I'm quite comfortable with. And the topic, fostering research and innovation in obstetrics and psychology and women's health is quite appropriate and contemporary. Women's health to be seen as a critical contributor to the national economy. And we all know why. Unfortunately, Indicators and data that are currently available clearly show that there is still a lot more to be done to improve on women's health in Nigeria. In terms of maternal health deaths, for, this, for instance, we recently overtook India to become the leader. This is clearly on our side. The guest speaker. Professor Friday Okonofwa, with whom I proudly say again, I've had about 51 years association. We met when we were 17 years old, far away in the Lafe. Professor Okonofwa was a bookworm. He had no time for worldly things that we engaged in. He was always reading his books and he was always beating us flat at exams and tests. It is no wonder that he has become a renowned scholar, an academic of repute, and an internationally recognized obstetrician and gynecologist. We that engage in worldly things, I don't think we've done badly here. He wears a lot of caps, and he was former pioneer vice chancellor of the Novell University of Medical Sciences. I said Novell because the concept of medical universities is new, but it's catching on. And I personally believe that that is the way we should go. We should have now 
our own medical universities that will cater only for medical sciences and subjects so that we can free ourselves from the vagaries of they have PhD, they don't have PhD, they have fellowship, they don't have fellowship. Let us have our own medical university. Professor Konofa, congratulations for pioneering that. And I believe that we would have a lot more in the future. He is eminently qualified to thrill us with his knowledge and experience in the course of his research and innovative efforts in women's health over the years. I certainly look forward to the lecture. In conclusion, regardless of the recommendations which the guest speaker may make, I would like to lend my voice once again to the call to declare a national emergency in maternal and child mortality. There is now more than ever before an urgent need for meaningful and impactful interventions to remove Nigeria as the world capital for maternal deaths. It is a disgraceful cap to wear. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please sit back in comfort and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. All right, before I hand over to Dr. Sunday Omishakin, another round of applause for our chairman of today's occasion, Professor Adeto Gumbo Oluche Gufabao. Sir, if you engage in worldly things and you became a professor, I also want to engage in worldly things. A round of applause once again for our chairman. Um, next on the program is supposed to be um, remark by uh, brief remarks by uh, by the chairman board of trustee, but she's um, unavoidably absent. So we'll be moving to the next one, which will be the brief remark by the provost, College of Medicine, Professor David Adewaleoke, BSc, MBBS, FICA, FMCP. If I was white, I would be blushing right now, just like my Professor Faban who said. Uh, all those ABCs don't really mean much, mean that much today. Uh, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Transformational Vice Chancellor. Professor Lua Tony Obidipe, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Man uh, Development Service, the lady who speaks in Queen's English, the Chairman of the Occasion, Professor Adetu Kumpo, uh, we've gone back years now, like you mentioned. And uh, I was really glad that it was you that I handed over to, because I know how competent and how focused you are. When I was with you, before I left last week, the chairman board of trustees, Abimbola, I know, Omolulu, Ulele, annual lecture in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, Incoming Vice Chancellor, Professor August, uh, Professor Polashadi Ugushola, the special guest lecturer, the guest lecturer, Professor Friday E. Okonufua, 
Uh, there's not much I would, your antecedent speaks much, very much for itself, sir. Uh, you've been editor to so many m medical journals, and uh, like the chief medical director of last said, uh, uh, I have never seen you in the tennis court or playing football, <laughs> but you have achieved a lot in, immensely in the in academics, particularly in the area of obstetrics and gynecology. The Deputy Provost College of Medicine, Professor O. E. T. Ebui, the College Secretary, Dr. O. E. Obafemi Moses, the Director of Finance. Dr. S. A. Akiyadi, the Director of Engineering, Mr. Oluyidi, Dean Faculty of Clinical Science, will be represented by Professor Lajidi Olawali, Head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, the professor that I accuse of working 27 hours a day, Professor Bosetti Afolabi. I think I don't know if I got it correctly. Your name is Bosset, not a Bosset. Acting Director, Office of Advancement, Mr. Seth Barry. All deans, directors, heads of departments, teaching and non teaching staff of the top of the university. The family of the late Mrs. Frederick Abimbola of Olulu Mulele. It be represented by another distinguished old boy of the Gobi College and uh, alumnus of this institution, Dr. Bolaji Akirili, members of the Fourth Estate, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My job here is very simple, and it's just to welcome you all to the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Welcome you to the fourth annual lecture titled Fostering Research and Innovation in Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Health. Uh, the women are taking over, so we really need to look after them. And uh, when, I'm saying, when I said they are taking over, it's very, very obvious in the University of Lagos and they are not just only taking over, they are doing great things. And with the injection of our incoming Vice Chancellor, I'm certain that uh, uh, the pride and joy of the university and the college will go higher and higher. It is a bit of relief to be back on campus after eight months post strike by ASU was suspended a few weeks ago. I want to express my sincere gratitude to the Office of Advancement and the Board of Trustees of Abimbola, I know, Omorodu Mulele Annual Lecture, which is the fourth in the series. The late Mrs. Frederick Abimbola, I know, Omorodu Mulele, who we are all gathered here today to honor and celebrate was indeed a woman of substance, an enigma and her meritorious service cuts across all fields of human endeavor. Her service to humanity cannot be forgotten as soon as she was a member of the Amadou Bello University Council, Nigerian University Commission, Nigerian National Commission, UNESCO, Board of Governors, Federal Radio Corporation of Nigeria, Governing Board, Nigeria French Village, amongst others. So she has really, really spread herself and distinguish herself in many endeavors. The topic for the fourth lecture in the series titled Fostering Research and Innovation in Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Health will be delivered by an uh, eminent and erudite professor, Friday E. Okonofua, who I'm certain will do justice to the topic. And I enjoy you all to sit back and have a very, very pleasant morning. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. The Provost College of Medicine, Professor David 
Antonio Oke. There was a time I called him Oke. He said Sheung. So if you want to remember my name, just look up. My name is Oke. And from then on, I never made that mistake anymore. Just joined us, representing the University Librarian, Professor Yetine Zaid CLN, is Dr. Gbemi Ogunleye. A round of applause for her. The Deputy Provost College of Medicine is also here, Mr. Kayadi Owotutu. A round of applause for him also. With the kind permission of Professor Ayedila Shenwa, some schools are here. We just want to quickly just welcome them. Betriman High School, School of Midwifery, uh, Baptist Bowen College, Atun Ashe Senior High School, Idiarapa High School, Luth College of Medicine, University of Lagos Muslim Community, John Sock College, PMP Schools, Tom Vick Comprehensive College, Eco Boys Senior High School, and Anglican Girls Grammar School. You are warmly welcome to this event. Thank you very much for coming. At this juncture, I want to quickly move to the next item, which is remarked by Special Guest of Honor. I have my senior from the best secondary school in the world here. I'm talking about Ibubi College, Yaba. Dr. Bolaji Akirine is here with us. Those who agree that Ibubi is the best to say hi. Those who don't agree, say me. The eyes are big. Chairman of this occasion, Professor Adetokumo Opabangu. The guest speaker, Professor Friday D. Okonofo. The Vice Chancellor, University of Lagos, ably represented by Professor Asenwa. Deputy Vice Chancellors, Provost College of Medicine, Professor David A. Oke. The Registrant, Secretary to the Council. Here, yeah, if represented, executors of the donor's will, Mrs. Ayrat Adebaloma, Mrs. Lady Shashem, the chairman of the board of trustees of Federica Bipala in Namurlu Munile Endowment, Professor Polasha D. T. Omushala, and other members of the board, members of the Darucha Fodu family, Darucha family, and Mulele family. All deans and directors, professors, lecturers, all heads of departments, members of the university community, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, our dear students. Um, I stand before you this morning to read the address of uh, the speech by, prepared by Mrs. Angela Omolara. Branco, SRN, SCM, on this occasion of the port, Dame Abibola, you know, Molulu Mulele, annual lecture in obstetrics and gynecology. Um, whatever I read to you, if there's any mistake, error of omission or condition, please let it go to my cousin, the writer. But whatever I also read, I mispronounced that it's mine. So I'll start by saying that uh, most of the people at the high table have one connection or the other with them as part of the introduction. Starting from the uh, Professor Fabanwo, uh, Mrs. Akerele of last week, enough on that, you understand. <laughs> Same to Professor Adewale Oke, the Gobi College, College of Medicine, University of Paris. Professor Asenua happened to have taught my daughter law at the university. And he host of many others like that. So we have interconnectivity, you know, when we are together, when we meet at occasions like this. So the main meet of the, I will read the speech and I'll have some anecdotes of what Dame Abibola I know had done in my life. I'll just give you a few examples. Now, for the main uh, speech, uh, this is uh, Angela Abolara who happens to be a sister to the donor 
endowment. On behalf of the Derocha family and Muliri family of Lagos, I welcome you all sincerely to the fourth annual lecture in perpetuity for my late beloved eldest sister, Dame Abimbola Ainamolu Molele. For me, it's a momentous occasion and a milestone in the history of the University of Lagos. My sister, Dame Federica Abimbola Ainamolu Molele, was generous in life by donating four endowments. Initially as professorial chairs and later changed because of insufficient funds to annual lectures. Two annual lectures. Two annual lectures to the University of Lagos. And uh, one each to Obafemaola University and Oshun State University. She also made allowance in her will for the National Catholic University and the Catholic Seminary. The family appreciates development in the modification of the objectives of the endowment to include research activities. She was the first female Nigerian graduate in law to attend a university. Apart from a BL, LLB, she also had LB in French. And between French and English, Unless you are close to us, you wouldn't know which you know which grade of the languages she was because she was so fluent in the two languages. <coughs> she awarded many scholarships at the primary school and secondary school levels and the tertiary institutions at home and abroad during her lifetime. She was a woman of the highest integrity and a strict disciplinarian of the highest principle. May her soul rest in peace. She threw away her wig and gown as a practicing lawyer to see to her interest in the child education in Nigeria by founding Afodu Darucha Abimbola Abonulu at Rao International School, based in Victoria Land Lagos, which embraced primary and secondary schools at both Anglophone and francophone levels. Dame Federica Bimbola Aina Omolulu Mulele offered meritorious service to her fatherland and the service transgressed important segments of Nigerian national life. The services included membership of the following organizations, as read out by Professor O.K. not long ago. She was also director and chairman of Lodi Diani Nigeria Limited, a building construction company. Merit awards were lavished on her, particularly for her contribution to education by various groups, namely the Nigerian Brazilian Chambers of Commerce, Nigerian French Language Village, and for the best standard international school, that is, a graduate international school. She was also honored by the Nigerian Girls' Guide Association. Mrs. Federica Abimbala Obolu Mulele was a trailblazer. She contributed significantly to the educational progress of children at all levels. She was extremely generous, highly principled, and full of make of kindness. She loved God and she loved mankind. Members of her family, relations, friends, and her pupils. May her gentle soul rest in perfect peace and may light perpetual shine upon her. On behalf of our family, I wish to express our deep appreciation to the University of Lagos for the perfect logistics and arrangement for this lecture and to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nuato Inokudipe, it represented by Professor Asenwa, supported by the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Provost College of Medicine. We are also grateful to the chairman of this occasion, Professor Ade Tokumbo, Obama, and to our guest speaker, who I know will deliver an educating and brilliant lecture. Our thanks also goes to the chairman of the Board of Trustees and the director of the Office of the Director of Procurement, and also the executors of my sister's will, Mrs. Ira Tadi Balogo and Mrs. Ladi Shashem, and, and to Professor Afoladi, Head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They all played major roles in the success story of the annual lecture series. And thank you all.
Finally, I say again, thank you and thank you in the words of William Shakespeare. I wish you all God's speed and blessing till we meet again in 2023, 2023, Lord willing, for the next set of lectures. Now, my anecdote. The late Mrs. Patrick Cardinal Amonlu Mulele took up my second education from, from three in Nibundi College. And just as that, I even earned a scholarship to study medicine here at the College of Medicine. She did not relent. And I twice she sponsored me to UK for holiday while as a medical student. She also she didn't relent on that. After I had qualified, my first car, she got ready to a brand new car. But I go to CFO and pick a new car. Even after getting married, by building my very house, she got back to it. So she's a, she was a woman with very large heart. I cannot finish, you know, describing how good she was to everyone of us. In Yoruba, they say, Once you are a relative, even those who are not relatives, relative, who are very distant to her, she helped. Not to talk of those who are even have blood relations. So I want to thank God for her life. The usual life she, 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 she spent while on earth, and also the life she touched and what she well, enduring legacy she left behind, like the one we are celebrating today. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bolaji Akrili, representing the family and the donor. And we also have Mr. Sheyo Gumbi and Mr. Tade Ladiko, representing Aramide and Femi Mulele here. Thank you. Um, there was a slight error committed by yours truly calling Mr. Kaede Owutu to the deputy provost. He's the deputy college secretary. The provost was looking at me that, Sheung, is there something I miss? Maybe it's just an opportunity very quickly to tell you this Sheung that you are looking at is an Olodo of the highest order. The worst thing to happen to an individual is to do follow follow from junior class to senior class. The prerequisite for going to science class is your understanding of your intro tech and integrated science. But I did follow follow in junior class thinking it was going to help me in senior class. The brilliant students usually sit in front like Professor Okonofua. And they will always be raising their hand. They want to attempt every question. So I joined the bandwagon that day in chemistry class to say, you must answer and you must ask me, even when I knew I didn't know anything. They were teaching them types of gas. Everybody has said so many things, nitrogen, helium, oxygen. So I was raising my hands like I was angry that this teacher had been neglecting me since. The teacher said, oh, she, over time, I've been neglecting you. What are the other types of gas? And I said, are you talking to me, ma? You know when your hand is beginning to win? I said, he said, yes, you, she, I said, they mentioned everything. He said, no, there are still some other types of gas. He said, okay. I said, ma, is it this? Yes, you, Sheung, other type. I said, okay, tear gas. He said, eh? I said, fabric gas. I said, never, don't come back to my class. That was how I quit science class. And I just had to say, Sheung, you are not caught for this. Ladies and gentlemen, I hand over to Dr. Sonde Omishaki to introduce the person who will take the citation of our guest lecturer. Distinguished, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. I just want to repeat, uh, before I do that, to, to recognize the presence of uh, a lot of deputy directors of nursing services here present, and also our former dean, College of um, Faculty of uh, 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 Sciences, uh, Professor Adeyemi, is here present too. And uh, I've also seen um, somebody that, um, do, I, I only met him recently, uh, but what I know about him is that he can, when he sits with you for five minutes, he can generate the paper. And that is Professor S.H. Yeah. Well, it is my first time I've seen Professor Okono for actually. But I was in Ife for six months as uh, on output when I was somewhere in Federal Medical Center, Bekuta. If I move to the left, I will hear Professor Friday Okono for. To the right, Professor Friday Okonofa. And what I also heard was that once you are very close to him, before you clock 40, he would have been a professor. <laughs> and uh, also we used to hear, I don't know if it is true or not, that when it comes to women's health uh, program, and you generate 
a topic that is known to prove, and you are trying to say it in a way that is not clear, he will not sit down there. He will stand up and tell you. That it, was a, it was a conference in one of the European countries. And I, Professor Friday Kondova, stood up and corrected them. Down there. <laughs> Sir, it's a big privilege to see you today. Now I'm going to call on Dr. A.A. A. Okunawa to uh, give the citation of Professor Friday Okunawa. All right, uh, standing on existing protocol, uh, I would like to call upon the uh, guest lecturer for today to face wise as you give your citation. All right, uh, before I start, I think as uh, the MC said, I've heard so much about you, sir. And I think it's my very first time of meeting you in person, and I take it as a great privilege and an honor to read the citation. So I'm just going to read some very few lines of this citation, very long citation that uh, I don't think if you want to read it, you can't finish it in, in one hour. Right. So Professor Friday uh, was born in Eko Ewu Edo State, Nigeria. He attended African Grammar School Epoma and Edo College, Benin City, for his secondary school education and also his higher secondary school education. Following an outstanding performance in his West African uh, certificate examination, he proceeded to the University, to Abafemi Awolo University, the Great Ife, where he obtained his first Bachelor of Science degree in Health Sciences in 1975, and thereafter his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree in 1978. He was an outstanding medical student with many honors and awards, among which were Professor Pattinson's Prize of Best Student in Internal Medicine in 1975 and Professor Kenny's Prize of Best Student in Anesthesia in 1977, just to mention a few. But he commenced his professional career at the medical, as a medical intern in the University of Benin Teaching Hospital between 1978 and 1979. After completing his youth service in Ogun State in 1980, he returned back to Obafemi Awolowo University Teaching Hospital for his residency training program in obstetrics and gynecology, where he became the chief president in 1984. Following an outstanding uh, performance in his residency training, he became a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons in 1984, fellow of the Medical College of, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology of the National Postgraduate Medical College in 1985. He obtained a faculty position as a lecturer at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Bafemla Wola University in 1986 and rapidly rose to the position of senior lecturer in 1981-87, a year after, associate professor in 1989 and professor of obstetrics and gynecology in 1992. He later transferred his services to the University of Benin in 1996, where he has been the head of department, dean, provost, and member of the University Governing Council. As a man of academic uh, pursuit, he obtained his PhD degree in International Health and Population Studies in uh, Karolinka's Institute in Stockholm in Sweden. Professor O'Connor's research interests include maternal and newborn health, especially in sexual and reproductive health, safe motherhood, and adolescent health reproductive health. Professor Okonofa is a global champion in women's health, a discipline where he has published more than 350 journals articles, three books, 26 book chapters, 22 monographs, and obtained 48 international research grants. His most recent edited book, Contemporary Obstetrics and Gynecology in Developing Country, published by Springer's Nature in August 2021, comprises 69 chapters, and is one of the most comprehensive textbooks ever published in the discipline in African region. In recognition of this awesome performance and career, 
He was honored with an honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, and also with a special award as champion of women's health by the University of California. He's a founder of the Women's Health and Action Research Center, one of the Nigerian leading NGOs, and also the founding editor of the African Journal of Reproductive Health, voted the best journal in Nigeria by the National University Commission in 2005. He's a team leader of the World Bank Center for Excellence in Reproductive Health Innovation and the coordinator of the World Bank Project at the University of Benin in Nigeria. He was the pioneer vice chancellor of the first University of Medical Sciences in Ondo State, in Nigeria, from March 2015 to March 2020. And now he's the director of grants and research at both Women's Health and, and Action Research Center and the University of Benin in Nigeria. He's currently the co-chair of Harvard University research team on rethinking malaria in the context of COVID-19 and also a co-chair of, of the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Health Committee on Sustainable Programming on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. In October 2020, the African leadership voted him runner-up of the Evidence Leadership Award in Africa for Development Policy and also the African Academy of Science for Research leading to policy development in Nigeria. He's a member of several international organizations and committees, including the editorial board of the British Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology. He's a reviewer to more than 20 international journals and a technical consultant to many international agencies, including the World Health Organization, MacArthur's Foundation, and Ford Foundation. He has served as director, as the executive director of the International Federation of, of Gynecology and Obstetrics, and also as honorary advisor on health to the former president, Professor, uh, President Ulusha Egon Obasanjo in Nigeria. He's a recipient of several honors, very few among which are Distinguished Alumnus Award of Obafo Mawola University, Special Achievers Award by the Nigerian Television Authority, Distinguished Service Award by the Society of, uh, of Gynecology and Obstetrics in, uh, of Nigeria, and an award of Most Outstanding Professor of the People by the Student Union Government of University of Benin, is happily married with children. Therefore, I present to you our distinguished guest lecturer for today, an icon in obstetric and gynecology of global repute, an erudite scholar, fellow of the African Academy of Science, fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science, fellow of the Royal College of Obstetric and Gynecology, fellow of the International College of Surgeons, fellow of the West African College of Surgeons, Fellow of the National Prosperity Medical College of Nigeria, and also a high chief, Ife of Okwela of the Okwela Kingdom, Professor Friday, the good dad, the Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I felt a little bit embarrassed because <clears throat> I didn't know you are going to go into my secrets. <laughs> Some of the things I've kept for long. And uh, I want to thank you for that very great introduction and for all that you said about me. But first of all, let me make a declaration. Today I'm not too well. I'm actually not well today. So that whatever I do today, please pardon me if I make mistakes. Please know that yesterday morning I came down with very severe malaria. And my wife was actually pushing that I should come. But I told her that Professor Polabi would kill her. She wanted to speak to my childhood friend, Professor Fabao, to see whether Fabao could change the situation. And I told her if he speaks to Fabao, then Fabao will convince her the more. So you better not speak to Fabao. So please pardon me today. If I'm not in my very best, that's part of all of the good things have been said about me. The Vice Chancellor of this great university, Professor Ulua Toyin Gudipe, my great friend, the presenter here today, are also my great friend, DVC in charge of development of the university, Professor Aya Asenua. 
who I've known for more than 25 years. So when we talk about reproductive health, these are my champions that I have worked with that helped us to introduce the rationale and the justification for reproductive health to this country. Thank you very much. The chairman of this occasion, my friend, my colleague, my brother, when he said we knew when we were 70 years old, he was right. As a matter of fact, uh, if he was not from Okun State or Lagos State, he was from Medo State, I'm sure we would have come from the same mother. So I call him my brother, Professor Okumbo, Baba Wu. An interesting thing is that most of what he said, you know, we chat and discuss and play together from several years ago to now. This is the first time hearing him saying them. I'm really surprised. So, yeah. The chairman of the Board of Trustees of this great foundation and the incoming vice chancellor of this university. Also, my colleague for several years, Professor Fulashade Ogunshola, who is unavoidably absent. And I'm not seeing her here, but I wanted to congratulate her today for her appointment. Principal officers, the provost, the College of Medicine and University of Lagos, other principal officers here present. The deputy provost is my very good friend. The special guest of Fono, who is uh, represented here today by Dr. Bolaji Akurile, and representative of, uh, of, the, of the donor, family of the donor. Other members of the high table, very distinguished standard members here present. Professors, I can see my uh, dear professors in Ops and Ghana here present. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I want to first of all thank those who invited me to deliver this lecture today. Because I know there are so many other very competent persons that would have been called upon. I want to specifically recognize and thank Professor Olami Jula, who in fact invited me in the first place before Professor Afula being continued. And I'm really very proud. When somebody said earlier on today that this program is very well organized. Uh, even though I've not been well recently, and there was no way I would have disappointed you knowing the temerity, the intensity which you have put to organize this lecture. So, next slide. The first question I would like to ask, who, who was Mrs. Abimbola, Aino, Omolulu, Mulele for whom we are here today. You can see a picture there. The woman that was for whom we are here today. She is a philanthropist. And although I don't know her, <clears throat> she's been described with very great words by so many people as an educationist, a lawyer and is philanthropist by excellence. And so, from what I've read about her, I can surmise that in her lifetime, she epitomized and exemplified some of the most endearing principles and tributes in womanhood, including self-discipline, patriotism, a large heart, as somebody just said, great transparency and social responsibility. And if all of you know me, those of you who know me, I'm very, very passionate about women. I'm not saying I don't like men, but I love and like women. That's the truth. I don't hide it. Because in all my dealings with women, both my mother, my sisters, my children, women have been very special in many ways than one. And most of the successes that people say that I have made have been engineered by women. All of them. And I see them always being transparent, honest, and if they want to support you, they'll support you with the whole of their body. <laughs> hold you back. 
So I want to remind the uh, Professor Aseno Wa that remember there was a similar lecture I gave. You asked invited me to give the woman who died in Uganda. Whenever I'm invited to talk about women, I'm always very happy to do so. Because women made me what I am today. That's another story for another day. Another day because I'm writing my, my book. And you will see how women, from up to this very moment, women are the epitome of my life. Mrs. Mulele has been described as extremely generous. Let me also tell you, generosity uh, has many faces. But how is coming from my heart. It's highly principled and full of the meek of human kindness. And she loved, she loved God, she loved mankind and humankind, members of her family, relations and friends. So the still guests, next slide, ladies and gentlemen, it is this phenomenon Nigeria. This exemplary philanthropist, a role model by essence, compassionate legend, and a transcendent woman of excellence, the Nigerian breed, that has left this very important milestone and legacy that we are here today to celebrate. We give God the glory. And I hear say may her gentle soul continue to rest in the person of our Lord Jesus. Next slide. When Madame Abimbola Mulele was endowing this particular lecture, he said the objective of the endowment is to form research. Today, I'm not going to speak big grammar. I'm going to calm down because I see the audience is very mixed. It would be wrong for me to be speaking big, big grammar when we have secondary school students here. So I'm very sure young <coughs> children on the university secondary school, that you will understand the lecture I'm going to give you. So that in future you will choose to become a medical doctor, you will choose to become a gynecologist, and you will choose to become a philanthropist, just like Mulele is doing. So when Mulele gave this endowment to the University of Lagos, he gave it an objective, and which is to fund research from time to time as well as to enhance industry university cooperation through the use of research findings in the field of obstetric and gynecology. Obstetric and gynecology is just the science that takes care of women when they're about to deliver and takes care of women related to their reproductive organs. That's it, that's what it is. <clears throat> when we talk about research, we're talking about research that enables us to know new things about the specialty. What do you know? When you do research, you are doing research to find out new things, to open your eyes more to some of the things that can be done better in that field. So give me my passion for years of research. <clears throat> I reflected on this topic, and I was also given the opportunity to choose the title of the lecture today. I therefore considered it worthwhile for me to reflect on the state of research in obsess and gynecology. It is hoped that it will help us to galvanize efforts to promote women's health in this country. Because there are still a lot of challenges that have to be met. Because if you take a review <coughs> of the entire field of science and technology, you will find out there are still many unknown facts. I'm sorry, I just have to. About the specialty, thank you. And for which you need additional research. Research meaning you want to find out what is not known so that you know it. But what of what you read in the books we are done, we are identified through research. So if we stop, we have not got to the extent of knowledge about what is all to be known. Not even the field of obstetric psychology. I can say we only know about 1% of all that needs to be known in that field. So what happens to the remaining 99%? So I decided to choose next slide. In compliance with the wishes of our benefactor, I decided to choose the title Fostering Research and Innovations 
in orthopedics and gynecology and women's health. And with the objective to discuss the current state of research and innovations in orthopedics and gynecology and women's health in Nigeria. Indeed, given my long years of education, service delivery, and research in the specialty. Next slide. I've decided to dis divide this into five sessions, and I will make it as simple as possible. First, I will synthesize the amount of research and innovation that we know the women said the science and gynecology worldwide and in Nigeria. How much of knowledge do you know about this area? In the second session, I will expatiate one of the key operational words, which is funding for research. Because without money, you can't do research. And then thirdly, I will review the state of university industry leakage and partnerships in obstetrics and gynecology and women's health in Nigeria. To what extent are universities partnering with industry to generate new areas of research in this country? And then fourthly, I will look at how research findings which we currently have in women's health and obstetrics and gynecology are being used by governments. It's not just enough to do research and then actions are not taken. For example, we say we need education to produce maternal mortality. To what extent is government promoting education as a way to reduce maternal mortality? So those are the five sessions. And I'm going to be relatively fast. I don't want to bore you anything. Next slide. So I'll first start with overview of research and innovations in obstetrics and gynecology and women's health. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that from the offset that Obstetrics and gynecology is a very recent discipline. A very recent discipline. And it started as an art, simply for us to deliver women. That's how it started. And at the time it started, it was just to deliver women of the aristocratic, aristocratic class. At that time, women did not belong to that class, deliver anywhere like animals. So it was, it was first called midwifery. And many people were desired at that time to deliver the global riches in the United Kingdom. So, the father of gynecology today is known as James Marion Sims. That's the name of the person we normally call father of gynecology. But he did a lot of controversial experiments with black people, especially in the US at that time. And therefore, he became a controversial person. And today, he's still mentioned as a father, but he did experiments with black people with negated fairness at that time. The Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which today is where all of us go to, was established only in 1930. And the British Journal of which is one of the things we do when we are publishing research findings, was established in 1902. But as before then, a lot of donors have been established before then. So, obstetrics and gynecology came later. First, because it was simply an art. And today, what we do is that when you are going to be trained as a gynecologist, they teach you how to operate, how to deliver, how to make complications. Not necessary to conduct research. I don't know whether you understand. The discipline was first focused on the art of this, this, delivering a woman, learning how to do uh, uh, assisted. Uh, bridge delivery, how to do uh, bridge extraction, how to do caesarean section, process delivery, and so on and so forth. The, the technique of doing things, but not to find out with the research was driven with background. It's only recently that research has been added. The first journal in obstetrics and gynecology was established in 1870. Before then, several science journals in the art of medicine of the statute. So engine is a very relative uh, new discipline. Next slide. I wanted to show here that most of the discoveries which are groundbreaking in obstetrics and gynecology have been done by other disciplines rather than by obstetrics and gynecologists. I'll give you three examples. 
One is ultrasonography. I will explain this later. The second is in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. The one we call test to baby. It wasn't necessarily discovered by a gynecologist, but today everybody is enjoying it. Gynecologists are not using it. And then genomics. Three, this genomics is the science of the genes, whereby in 2003 they did the human genome project. Next slide. The first one is ultrasound, which basically means that you can do a test very safely done. The woman is pregnant. You can do a scan. Many of you must have had ultrasound scan being done. And then you know how many babies the woman is carrying, where the baby is staying, uh, whether it's presenting by head or by bridge, and then the size of the baby. That ultrasound technique was actually discovered around, let me say, 1970s. 1970s. At that time, it was a very big ultrasound machine. I remember the one we had in Ife. Even in 1984 or 5, it was a very big giant machine. But at that time, it was still being developed. But it was a professor and donant, an obstetrician and gynecologist in Glasgow, who popularized the use of ultrasound in the discipline of our cell oncology. But however, it was an engineer, Tom Brown, that first crafted the product of the science of ultrasound system. So what that simply means is that we are talking about discovery, talking about research, talking about innovation. Most of this research that we now conveniently use in North and Ghana were not necessarily discovered. Simply so saying that research is still very nascent. That we as gynecologists are being trained to deliver women successfully, to repair cesarean session, to carry out forced delivery, but not necessarily, I will come to that later, not necessarily to do science and to do research, even though it's a science subject I will have. Next slide. In vitro fertilization, test to baby. The initial animal experiment started with by, was started by a physiologist. His name is Patrick Stepto. He later invited and worked with Robert Edwards, at that time professor in Cambridge, an obstetrician and gynecologist, to perfect the human procedures. Even though their original experiments resulted in bad animals, they wanted to transfer that science to human beings. And it was that collaboration between Step 2 and Edwards that resulted in the first, in the birth of the first IVF baby, Louis Brown, in July 1978. At the time, we were finishing medical school, sir. That's where Louis Brown was born. Step 2 died in 1985. Why Edwards received the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology in 2010. What I'm saying is that if you want to solve a major problem, I'm going to come back to that later. We as gynecologists cannot do it alone. We have to collaborate with other sides. Interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. It's so important. The next, uh, next slide. The next discovery I want to talk about is genomics. If you listen to what is being discussed about the world now, genomics, genomic engineering, all about it, to do so many things. And if I do genomics, don't be surprised that diseases that are currently incurable, like sickle cell disease, like diabetes mellitus, occasionally will now, in future, will become curable. In fact, when I went to a meeting recently, they are talking about how to prevent death, that death will no longer occur through genomics. That there will come a time, actually they are portrayed by 2063, that human beings will not die because of aging. You can actually revert back to your age. You can only die if you have an accident, road traffic accident and so on and so forth. And that is what genomics has done for us. The Human Genome Project was completed in 2003, and through that, it allowed so much research. Today, if I don't do genomic science, then basically, they are just at the periphery of research. And yet, this was brought about by interaction between different scientists, physicists, chemists, biologists, computer scientists, mathematicians, and bioinformaticians. What that simply means is that no single discipline 
has done it. And I don't know of any single major discovery that has been undertaken by gynecologists alone. Next slide. And that's why I want to say that looking at Nobel Prizes, to the best of my knowledge, and after for only two, you know Nobel Prizes are is the prize you give to the best researchers in any discipline in the world. It can be in, in uh, humanities, it can be in economics, and this year, I think they've been giving Nobel Prizes across various disciplines. To date, only two gynecologists worldwide have received the Nobel Prize. Meaning that if you continue to deliver women and continue to do cesarean session and continue to do hysterectomy, you will not get a Nobel Prize. You will not get it. If you like, stay in the labor world and do the phallic bashing and do also do the short to miss. <laughs> Only two. Professor Roberts for IVF work. He break grounds, not because he was delivering babies, that's a gynecologist. All of the work he did in delivering babies, he didn't any in the breakfast. And then Professor Dr. Dennis Mukenye, I'm sure you know him. He got the Peace Prize, not for research. But that's the only one, he got it because of the amount of work he did in addressing the rape as a weapon of war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where he treated about 51,000 women. It was about two or three years ago. He got it in 2018 for his work in that area. Those are the two gynecologists. And I don't know why we, and scientists, whether gynecologists, today I'm talking about gynecologists, we as medical practitioners work in Africa should be able to aim to also give to get the best price. So, talking about the quantum of research in obstetrics and gynecology and women's health, next slide. I found out doing some work that in 2021, there were about 214,000 articles published internationally, math as related to obstetrics and gynecology. 214,000. Out of this, 31,000 were published in Africa. And then 17,000 were published in or about Nigeria. What that means is that when you say 17,000 articles published, about Nigeria doesn't necessarily mean that were published by all are written by Nigerian authors. Anything said about Nigeria, whether it was written by somebody in Congo, becomes an article that relates to Nigeria. About 17,000 of those were published in 2021. And then more specifically, I looked at these articles about sexual and reproductive health and women's health. That's where more articles have been published. It's a very new and important and engaging discipline for which Nigeria has been found to be an outlier in the implementation of the ICPD focus of action, which started in 1994. ICPD talks about women being at, at the center of development, women being given priority. There's a paradigm shift from focus on family planning to that on women's health, women empowerment, and so on and so forth. And every time you talk about sexual and health that's inadequate, Nigeria comes first as one country where many things are not being done. So it is not surprising that in 2021 alone, there were nearly 44,000 articles and research on reproductive health published in and about Nigeria relating to sexual health. Next slide. Now, this is another worrying aspect. When I reviewed uh, the publications, you know, research is so uh, progressive. And one would like to see research that end up in ideas that lead to new discoveries, new inventions, innovations. Unfortunately, because when I say innovations and discoveries, you know, uh, boys and girls here listening, somebody discovered the microphone. So we want research that will lead to the discovery of something like this microphone in respect to obstetrics and oncology. The smartphone you are using was discovered by somebody. Is that okay? It is only a very good type of research that can lead to that type of research that can enable you to discover something like that. So when I looked at the reviews of publications, just to summarize, in obstetrics and gynecology and women's health in Nigeria, show that they are mainly descriptive research based on describing oh, women are dying, oh, women are family planning, 
This is the type of family they are using. And they have full retrospective data that have been there before, which often are difficult to even quantify and to correct, correct, collect. Cross sectional service, systematic reviews, reviews of articles that have been published, and maybe qualitative, speaking to people, interviews, and then doing qualitative analysis. And they are often with nationally uh, conducted service, such as demographic and health service which often lack the recency. We are collected in 2018. We are analyzing them here. How can you make conclusions from that? And however, when they do survey, prospective surveys and constitutional reviews, the sample sizes are often small, which means that whatever results you get are only, uh, can only be used for the area for which you collected them. So if you say, uh, let's look at the number of women using who have had a female genital mutilation in Lagos State. And you go to one part of Lagos State, one local government, or one community. That result is not generalizable to the whole of Lagos State, not to talk about the whole of Nigeria. Is that okay? Because the sample sizes are often very small, and the way you collected them may actually not be externally generalizable. That's one problem. Second problem. Next slide. Now, when we talk about intervention, today we say maternal mortality is very high. Number of women who die during childbirth is about 58,000 per year in Nigeria, which is the second highest in the world after India. But I think uh, somebody said uh, India has, Nigeria has about taken India just now. 58,000 women die every year because they are trying to give birth. Can you imagine that? The reason that they die, we know them. We know the reasons. We know the reasons. And like I told my gynecologist friend, they know that there's delay one, delay two, delay, two, delay three. Isn't it? That's why they die. So, why is it that we have not been able to find solutions to those reasons so that women no longer die? So, we call that interventional research. Research that will provide solutions to the reasons that certain things are happening for women in this country. So I, I've shown seen that there is deficit of interventional research. Why some intervention research are available, there has been limited evidence to show that they have been taken up by government or stakeholders to ensure they are used to improve the health of women. Thus, an important agenda in Dr. and Colleague of Women's Health lie in the domain of high quality prospective research, animal studies, community-based studies, as well as purposeful efforts designed to ensure the translation of research for use for policy and practice in the country. Governments should base what they do for us on results of research. So if they are going to cite the Power Health Center, it should be cited in the places where they are best, most needed, rather than citing them in a place where somebody will get political reward for such, uh, for such an action. So, to summarize, the characteristics of leading to deep innovation and research, some of the characteristics of research that you need one, we should focus on developmental challenge rather than say topic. As I said, what is the major developmental challenge in obtain and gynecology and women's set in this country? That, so you focus research on that rather than saying I just want to know what is the project, what is the challenge we have in Lagos State, what talent we have in uh, Limo Shaw local government and so on. You focus the research agenda on that. And that, with that, you will see that what you need to accomplish that is interdisciplinary. If you are focusing on research, development that talent, no one discipline can do research alone. You cannot say, oh, today women are dying in uh, a little more local government. Only gynecologists are the only one that can stop. It's not true. But gynecologists don't even know when the problem starts. When the women come to their home, 
There are reasons why they will not leave their home. It might be economic reasons. Poverty may be a factor. They may be coming to the hospital. The road might be bad. Somebody needs to clear up the roads and so on and so forth. Religious factor may be involved. It may be that the pastor said, don't go. They will kill you and so on and so forth. So you need multidisciplinary. More and more, I hardly do research. I think that uh, Professor Faber is the one I've done most research with. But I now work with sociologists, anthropologists, biostatisticians, pharmacists, basic scientists. I'll give you an example of research I've done. Before, when we were medical students, they said the twinning rate in Iguara, I'm sure you must have heard of that. Iguara. Iguara is in southwest Nigeria. I don't think it's too far from here. Iguara has the highest rate of twinning in the world. Higher than any other country. They know that. So when we were medical students, we said it was because of yam that we were consuming. So the question is, will we eat yam? People want to look for do competition on yam eating in this country. I don't think Bora will beat my village. Because in my village, we eat yam in the morning and in the afternoon and in the evening. Why would we go and have it? Pay me all the things. And we don't have it. So we wanted to conduct research. We started by doing anthropological research. No gynecologists there. We sent social scientists to go to Ebola to talk to the people there. Do you know that the tune rate here is very high? They say yes. What's the reason? We started, we started listening to them. And by the time they finished, we found out that their own idea of why the tune rate is high is because of their consumption of something they call Elasha, Elasa, Elasa. Let me bring my order first. So Elasa. So they say Elasa. It was very astonishing. We published it. That paper was led by an anthropologist. So after that, we now took Elasa. Let's go and collect this Elasa and feed it to rats. We actually brought, 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 brought the Dolly Rat from Lagos University, by the way. That's where we got the rats from. And took them to Benin. And we find these rats, one group with Elasa, another group with Yam, because we all of you said Yam. And then the third group, we gave them normal diet. The one with Elasa had four times liter size as compared, again, that paper will be published, as compared to the one with Yam. That research was done by agriculturists. They did formulation of the feed by biochemists, by biostatistician, gynecologists. I was sitting at the back. I was the one asking the question, why does it come to my tongue? And then thirdly, we are now trying to do a lot of work to isolate the ingredient in the Lhasa that accounts for the twin, twinning that we're observing. So that is interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. We must also use currency of national and regional data. We should not be using data for carry compiled in collected in 2018 to make uh, inferences in 2022. They must be community-based action research. The community stakeholders must be involved. If you are going to do something in the university in this in the secondary school, for example, you're going to find out whether they know about uh, say cancer of the service, the vaccine against human papilloma virus, and you want them to use it. They have to be involved in research. Otherwise, I can't finish research. So that's what we call community-based action research. And there are parents who have to give permission have to be involved. So that not only will the research findings be used, they will, on their own, after you've left, sustain the use of HPV vaccine, because we have enabled them to understand what is happening. And then we must also do quantitative research. Anybody who goggles my work and sees my publication over the last 10 years, we find that most of it has been quantitative research. Just talking to people, doing focus group discussions, in depth interviews, and so on and so forth. And we must also think about how to move research into commerce, gynecologists. I want to hear the product discovered by Professor Lamitula working with, you know the Medical Research Council, on how you can discover a product that goes into the market. And I don't want to talk too much because I don't want, how do you discover a product? Just like the smartphone was discovered and it's now being marketed and it's bringing money to the person who discovered it. 
such as the Facebook was discovered, and the man has become a billionaire. So also should we do research to also ensure that you come out with a product that can be patented and marketed, which you can then use to bring prosperity to you and your family. Next slide. I'll go to funding of research. Again, next slide. Africa is very deficient. Capacity of research. One of the reasons that we often don't do research is because of capacity of research funding. But the truth is that we are not very good at asking for research funding. Nobody will come and put research funding on the floor and ask you to pick it. I can tell you that one. That's one area. If you are a researcher and you are a university professor and you are waiting for research grant on your doorstep, you wait until that thing do not come. You have to look for it. Why developed countries often make good contribution to research? The reverse has been the case in many African countries. Next slide. Yeah, this is the GDP internationally. In Europe, Europe contributes 27% of their GDP to research. Asia is 31%. North America is 37%. No reason those countries are doing very well. South Africa, 1%. The rest of West Africa, 0.25% of their GDP to research. Even university funding has become so low. How do you put up a university? And the only thing the university does is to teach and do nothing else. That is disgraceful. There are three functions of university. One, service delivery. Two, research and three teaching. Today, 95% like is what we do for teaching. There's basically no serious research going on because there's no indigenous funding for research. So that is a worrying aspect. And yet, universities are supposed to be the engine of development for countries. The reason they have universities is so that they can pre governance research. I just came back from the US. I had this class three days ago. I think for the, I came back from where I visited MIT, visited uh, Harvard and one other place, one, I went to the University of Chicago. They are the ones driving development in America. In fact, I went to see the person who discovered the my, my Moderna vaccine. And they described it to me and described it to us, simple technology. And I met two Nigerians, beautiful Nigerians, walking there, small girls. They are using genetic engineering to walk there. And one of them was supposed to read medicine here. One guy told me, do you know I was supposed to read Messi, but uh, later on, this is this. Uh, my mother said, no, I should go to the U.S. I don't want to tell you who my mother is, because she's a very prominent woman. And as she got to the U.S., she was asked to read genetic engineering. And now she's being called upon all over the place to make vaccines. And in fact, when I was there, I said, well, you are, they said there are new viruses, new COVID-19 viruses coming up, this is this, and that they have the vaccines. So I went to one room. And they gave me one of the new vaccines, COVID-19 vaccine, because they have new variants. So I took it. So please, don't do that. I have uh, four vaccines. One of these is a new one, which I just got to do. So next slide. The start funding in Nigeria, everybody knows, is generally poor. And I want to say it is even poorer for health sciences. For, say, the reason is poor is that we as head care professionals, we don't look for funds. We don't look for funds. I'm telling you the truth. We at research grants availability are announced. You don't see doctors writing for proposals. They fall apart. Professor Afolabi, congratulations. You know what I'm mentioning here. The federal government of Nigeria reported in 2022 that it has become the, it has begun the processes for implementation of the 0.5% of GDP allocated to science, technology, and innovation to boost creativity and social economic development. Up to now, 2022 is about to end. Nobody has uh, told us whether they will still do it. Is that okay? Nothing has been done. The side funding is very poor. Next slide. But the good news is third fund. I must praise third fund. Third fund has two streams of research funding. One is the institutional grants, 
which they often give to investors and investors of Lagos, two million uh, naira if I apply for it to get it. Particularly if the research proposal you have developed is very good. And then the other one is the National Research Fund. I offer up to 60 million. You know? I think 2022 has passed. We are still waiting for the results. I think concept papers have been invited and uh, they selected those who want to go into proposals. And up to now, we don't know how many people have been selected. Am I correct? If anybody has got to let me know. In this year alone, Third Fund offered 10 billion naira, equivalent to 243 million dollars to the Nigerian uh, publicly funded investors. That is small. I want to tell you that one US university alone, Harvard University, I went to Harvard recently, and I was following, although I've been there before, I went around their facilities. Honestly, you can't believe it. You can't believe what they have. So we are giving $243 to the entire Nigerian universities. When Harvard University will have almost $5 billion for this last every year, it is something that we need to consider. Next slide. So, the challenges in Australia and Ghanaian is that, first of all, telephone is the only source of direct funding, but it's highly competitive. You have to write a grant. In my department of health and gaining, whenever they announce it, I will go to them, please write, please write, they refuse to write. I'm saying it now, they refuse to write. And ecologists are not very good at pursuing grants. They like to pursue private parties. <laughs> Individual universities, University of Lagos, let them tell us how much they need for research. I'm also talking, let me not talk about University of Lagos because my friends are there, University of Benin. How much an investor of Benin provided for research? I can tell you very, very small. Direct funding. And that's because even the indirect funding from the federal government is very, very limited in terms of even what we call support funding. When I was vice chancellor, we are not going to even to buy electricity. No talk of funding and research. Then teaching hospitals. I'm surprised. Teaching hospitals where OBGYN department are located. How much do they give for research in Oxford? They are supposed to allocate money for research. But I can say that most teaching hospitals consider research as a responsibility of the university. But they are the ones that we eventually work for. So I believe that they also, also fund. They don't fund at all. Now, I know that there are many international research now, but only the way to directly funds of foreign and ecology departments. Next slide. Other sources of funding include T.Y. Dajiban Foundation, which are the local sources, the Dangode Foundation, the Lumelu Foundation, and other foundations that are local. You go to them, ask them, they might give you money to do research. But you have to write a good research proposal. Then bilateral and multilateral organizations, such as the Plato, BFID, which is the UK government, the World Bank, and JICA, the Burmese government. And foundations such as MacArthur, Ford, IDROC, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. To date, many of these foundations have reduced their funding for women's health. I don't know why. Ford has reduced, MacArthur has reduced. Even Bill and Melinda Gates, you write to them, they will be talking one story or the other. They don't want to say that they have reduced, but they won't fund you. Is that okay? So it's a challenge. The industry, investing industry leakage. To what extent do we need to link research into industry? Because whenever you discuss something in university, the industry is the one that trans transfers it to use as a commercial product to be used by the general public. To date, research in Australian ecology have tended, next slide, to be based on solar efforts. Solar efforts by individuals based on Australian ecology. I don't know many departments of Australian that collaborate with other departments, very few. 
indeed. More and more, we need multidisciplinary and proper collaboration. And then clinical researchers, I believe, must learn to collaborate with sociologists, with basic scientists, with technologists, lab scientists, and other disciplines in order to find solutions to real time problems. So, if you are doing a research that is solo, it's unlikely that the industry will be interested. They don't they will think I don't solve the human problem, so they will not look at you. They will not tell you it's not good, they will be all you back and forth. It's when you are doing something that brings new life to the country that they will be interested. And that can only be when you do interdisciplinary research. So partnerships between industry brings a lot of benefits to the university, it enhances the state of the university, it makes you think big and make you look looking big for the future. Strengthens the brand of the university, and I think that uh, we all need to really see what is happening outside this country. It strengthens the brand of the university. It widens our global network among scholars and students. Provides opportunities for learning, from experience sharing, and opportunities for more funding. When you do collaborative work, I tell you the chances of being funded become much higher. Next slide. So, university research in Nigeria has been poor in the past in not translating research to products and outcomes because the industries are often not very well involved. The so called transdisciplinary research is now being advanced to provide a framework for this to ensure that social, economic, political, and environmental aspects influence human development and well being. Now, the triple helix, next slide. This is what we used to epitomize this collaboration. It's called the triple helix, which means when universities, industry, and government work together to foster economic development, the research should be based on development. So when they work together, government, academia, industry, it helps to foster economic development for the well-being of men and women. And now there's a fourth red B either, which is the media. Meaning that the academia does a part of research, the government should be informed, and industry should be involved, and the media should transform that for the use of general public. The next slide I'll show the benefits of university industry linkage, which I don't want to go over, it's too overwhelming. To know that the uh, benefits of the university, it includes expanded research capacity to collaborate with industry. They might even fund your department. And I think most of some of the funds we've got in the departments of ops and gang in this country have come from the industry, from Oscar Industries and so on and so forth. You know, they can lead to more funding, access to cutting edge and work projects, students' internships, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Now let's go to the last one, which is the use of research findings by government and stakeholders. Now there are two major factors. Next slide. Now first is the supply factor. Because if you have got the research, what do you do with it? How does government take it up? Stakeholders take it up. The first of all factors is the willingness and ability and capacity of researchers, which are the owners of the new knowledge, to transfer the results of research to relevant government. There are some people who don't do research and keep it in the and publish it and use it for their promotion. Nobody knows about it. So that unless it is published first of all in a relevant journal. The journal that can be read, and after you have read it, or you are put in that journal, you break it down, A, B, C, D, for other people to understand. Then you are not supplying the knowledge. Then the demand side is the willingness and commit commitment of governments to demand what is that data. How many people have come, Ministry of Health of, of Lagos State? How many times have they come to the Department of Ops and Gaining? They got lawsuit ask for information that guide them to do family planning and to do certain things. So demanding research uh, products, even if those results are not available, the fact that you are demanded it will make researchers to implement such research. So the supply factors, next slide, first researchers are often unable to disseminate their research findings 
And I think one of our colleagues said, the researchers simply do the research, they publish it in a journal, in order to help promotion, and they walk away. That is not good enough. Secondly, the media often are not engaged to help the process of dissemination. This is why we now include the media in the fourth edits. And they have never been fully used. And I know that right now we are presenting this lecture. I doubt whether there are many people, media people in the audience. Then the demand factors. The reason that demand of data is not very strong is because sometimes even the stakeholders and government may not understand the nature of, of the challenge that it requires data. And then, uh, the actually, most government officials will prefer to do things because they believe that data may not justify what they want to do in order to get, in order to get recognition in the area that they want to so, so for that reason, they may not even look at the field. So in Nigeria, efforts are required to build the knowledge and capacity of governments and critical stakeholders to demand and use data for policies and program development. And this will require training on data for decision making to managers and policy makers, making data easily accessible so that when you do your study, you make it easy to go such as through open access publications. The simplification of research results and data through fascist policy briefs, infographics, used in social media such as if say Facebook and finally reports. So ladies and gentlemen, let me go to recommendations. Recommendations. Number one, I'm making four recommendations. I'm not going to take time now, come to an end. So I don't like what to do. The first recommendation is that we ought to be strengthening curricula for research in undergraduate training, medical training. The curriculum for training research in undergraduate curricula is very, very weak in this country. And this deficient background knowledge and rotation is partly responsible for the poor uptake of research for head practitioners. So I believe that on a sustainable basis, when in the good old days, Professor uh, Grillo also identified this and said and recommended that we should strengthen basic sciences in you know, uh, a before people uh, proceed to the clinical departments. In those clinical departments, people tend to focus on the skill acquisition, learn how to take blood, how to plaque a patient, how to do vaginal examination, how to do scissor session, and so on and so forth. But they often don't include research. So Professor Quindo at that time made it compulsory for those of us who went to IFE to do a BSc for three years, meaning that we added one year to our training. So myself, Professor Fabaru, Professor Kolabi, we didn't do a BSc. We are the younger generation. And then Professor Ipong Dasson sort of did it. Am I correct? So in order to strengthen our work in research, and I remember my classmate then, Professor Grunty, wrote a BSc thesis that was bigger, the biggest BSc thesis I've seen. <laughs> what a Grunty. And he wrote so many things. And the boy told us he doesn't want clinical medicine. So and so forth. Later I went to Oxford, and I came back, became a professor of anatomy, and University of Jobs, but my classmate. He didn't want to practice because it was so much embedded in the research. Second recommendation is that we should strengthen postgraduate training. Postgraduate training curricular for research. Research in postgraduate training in North Carolina is also very weak. Let's not deceive ourselves. Very weak. The Nigerian Postgraduate College and the West African Postgraduate College. Uh, have what they call thesis. By the view of that, which I, I was once the Secretary General of the Nigerian Postal College. And since I left, I'm not convinced that the major revision has been undertaken, undertaken in the area of research component of it. 
may have the ask to write the thesis. But if I write the thesis, there should be a way you are trained to do research. You are trained to do research. So you can, the thesis job comes from us. There's no training. So uh, many of the thesis presented, I read many of them, often lack vigor. They find vigor for candidates wishing to develop careers in research orientation in research, to develop orientation in critical thinking and innovative delivery. So it's my personal opinion that the curricula for postgraduate training needs to be reviewed to include more purposeful, dynamic delivery of indicators of research. Such as maybe an article should be published in a peer review journal before, so I'll just say write a thesis. Let them publish one thesis, a journal before you come forward for your final exam. I'm just saying that, I'm not saying it's my recommendation. But you all know that currently, one of the reasons we're not able to compete with other scientists. I went to uh, this university in Ottawa, um, Covenant University, to give a lecture about three or four months ago. And while I was in the vice chancellor's office, I saw an undergraduate student coming with a thesis, holding the thesis like this. So I sat down and said, sit down. Tell me, what is that a thesis? Say, yes, she's a final year student. And that was her thesis. She was in business. I think her course was business, business. Was business, BIC in business or so, something like that. Social science, it wasn't mentioned. So I said, tell me, what did you, what research did you do? Do you know, I couldn't stop this guy. How did you do it? Probably methodology. How was the data analysis? Fantastic. So, after I delivered my lecture, I mentioned to the whole university that this guy, he definitely well. I did remember when I now donated something for her to promote her research interest. I, I think I was so confused that my last salary, I just gave it to her. <laughs> And I said, this is, if this can be done by an undergraduate, by the way, I went back to the University of Benin to tell them the story. And I told them that I currently supervise past masters and PhD students. And I was very convinced that some of my students cannot deliver the way that girl delivered on providing the way she did her research. But you ask her without any preparation, what are the objectives of research? How did you Chief, what are the methodology you use? How do you analyze? She said it. I was amazed. And I was. So, I could imagine, you can see the type of background in research. Later on, two days ago, the guy sent me a test telling me that she had a first class in our university. So, I wasn't surprised. So, ladies and gentlemen, research is the future of education in this country especially tertiary education. If you continue to teach and don't do proper research, after some time, the, the world will leave you behind. I'm very convinced about that. What will make you stand out as a professor is your international relevance. In the, 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 the internet that is not available, it's not for joke. If you press anything and you see result results, you see this. Not for joke. When I was doing my, my fellowship, I was going all over the place. The professor in Lego Library, I was trying to be to get results. But now you press your hand, you we'll see everything. If the next 10 years, if there's somebody who calls himself a professor in obstetrics and gynecology in this country who is not cited with a good citation index anywhere, and you press his name, and you don't see him on Google Scholar, you don't see him being ranked with H index, you don't forget him. Right now, for you to become a fellow of the chemical science, you have to have an H index of at least 20. An H index means have a publication which is pub which is cited up to 30 times. And the only way is to have a good standing background in research. Undergraduate and postgraduate. That's the only way, because when you graduate and become a fellowship, you will be to work like this. You can no longer talk to me about research. That's my experience. They finish and they become professors or senior lecturers and they become uh, lecturers. So the 
try to learn is why as an undergraduate, when they are still humble, and as postgraduate. And I want to talk about PhD at this point in time. PhD. There's no reason why we should be afraid of having PhD. Because I want to say our fellowship does not prepare us for research. Please say this one, I don't care anybody saying it. Our fellowship does not prepare us to compare with similar PhDs in other disciplines in this country. I know that. So if you want to do research, and you are interested in research, if it's about, you are, I'm not saying what are you, it's possible for you to do a PhD, please God, you see the difference. You see the difference. But if it is not possible, you can do things on your own and collaborate with other people who don't know. So let us not be angry because they're asking us to do PhD. I, I do know that they cannot. Yes, it is to promote research in the discipline. Then, the comment number three, funding of research. This makes sense. I think that uh, the most important thing is that government should equalize what it has promised and made. The university should try and put money aside for research. And this is all. Money for research is very important. And then teaching us to myself is up. Because if I'm a please put about 100 million next year for research. For what And then the final recommendation, grants writing. Now, for the discipline of women's health, people are so passionate about women. There's a lot of money floating around for people to apply for. Let me tell you, nobody will put money in your hands until you ask for it. Ask, they may refuse. But if you don't ask, you will never get it. So finally, one of the problems we have, do you believe that countries like Kenya, that are much smaller than Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, Ghana, they have more research funds than Nigeria? I went to the Department of OMG, Zimbabwe to a Sassana examiner, and there are almost 25 vehicles that they had in that department for almost about 30 grants that they had from various parts of the world. I took photographs and changed my department, and that was because they applied for the SAC grants. They asked, and they were given. Please, these grants are there. There is good capacity for all of us to be able to use them. So my appeal goes also to these donors to see ways in which they can continue to fund us. But most importantly, let us look out for best avenues that are available. If there's an announced a SAC grant, let us try and apply. Call for people, you get surprised and amazed. How is it? Because the challenges that people want to fund are here in Nigeria. And if you write it properly, you get the money that you need. So, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> conclusion. There can be no doubt that major challenges in obtaining and gynecology and women's health are very critical to Nigerians' future development. The high rate of maternal and child health and the high rate of maternal and child mortality in Nigeria is very worrisome, especially the rising concern that Nigeria may not be able to achieve the sustainable development goals related to these issues. As I've explained in this presentation, research and innovations that are currently poorly developed in the discipline in Nigeria will be one strong way to achieve further progress in the promotion of women's health and social development in this country. And this lecture, which is dedicated to the memory of our beloved Madam Mrs. Fadrika Bimbala, Omololu Mulele, will hopefully help us to rethink the process of research delivery in the context of obtaining oncology and women's health in this country. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think we can do better to give him a round of applause. We may please be seated. That was an excellent presentation from 
the guest speaker, Professor Friday E. Okonofua, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Health, University of Benin, Edo State, and the pioneer Vice Chancellor of Ondo State University of Medical Sciences. It was titled Fostering Research and Innovation in Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Health. Shawajida is not a proponent of mathematics, but I took details of Professor Friday Okonofua's lecture. It started exactly 12.16 p.m. and ended at 1.21 p.m. That means he spent one hour, five minutes, 47 seconds. A round of applause for him. Sir, I listen with rapt attention. One thing I desist from now. A friend of mine called me and I went to receive his call. Said, Shane, where are you? I said, I'm at College of Medicine. Sir, won't you check on me? I'm at Elasa. I said, no. Elasa is a no-go area now. He said, I said, there is no fighting here. He said, no. I'm listening to a lecture now and the professor said, Elasa in Ibora is a no-go area if you want to give back to twins. Twins is not in my calendar for now. So I don't want to come to Elasa so that you don't give me Elasa soup. And I will chop. The economy is uh, still somehow. So twins at this period is not uh, a no good area. Thank you very much, sir. A round of applause once again for him. We move swiftly to listen to a five, ten minutes presentation from Dr. Baba. Ochua. She is a Research 2019 Grant Award winner and coincidentally she is the first recipient of this grant. The women are just doing a miloko here and there. The Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Provost College of Medicine, the Chairman of this occasion, our invited guest speaker, permit me to stand on existing protocol. I'm a senior lecturer of the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. I won the first grant award of Omolodu Muleli Endowment Fund, and the research this fund was used to conduct. It's entitled The Role of Interleukin 6 and 16 Chain Polymorphisms in Pathogenesis and Disease Manifestations in Nigerian Women with Endometriosis. Endometriosis is, a, a, should I call it a gynecological dilemma? It's a condition that can be challenging to treat most times, basically because. Most of these patients often would present with pain, which can be excruciating and unbearable. It's led to um, the end of marriages for many of these women, and is a major contributor to infertility. By definition, endometriosis will refer to the presence of endometrial glands and stroma. That's the lining within the cavity of the uterus where the baby is supposed to reside. When we start having this lining at other sites, aside from within that cavity, we say such a patient has endometriosis. As many as 25 to 40% of women who have infertility have been found to have this condition. Like I said previously, pain is a common manifestation. And for this reason, we decided to see if there is an association with interleukin genes and the chronic pelvic pain, which most of these women often present with. There is paucity of research in genetics as a whole in sub-Saharan Africa, not Nigeria alone. I can remember the very first genetic study we conducted using the brain grants. During the literature search, there was 
no genetic study previously, especially in gynecology in sub-Saharan Africa. So why interleukin? Interleukins have been associated with pain. In most disease conditions in medicine, osteoarthritis, and several others. So we decided to study to know if there is a polymorphism in women with endometriosis compared to women without endometriosis. The objective of this study was to determine the serum interleukin and interleukin 6 concentration to see if there is a difference in women with endometriosis and women without endometriosis. Also, to determine if there is a genetic polymorphism in the interleukin 6 and 16 gene of women with endometriosis compared to women without endometriosis. And also to determine if there is an association between endometriosis related symptoms such as chronic pelvic pain and the interleukin 6 and 16 genes. It was a case control study which we conducted at our departmental clinic, the gynecology clinic to be precise. That's at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital here in Idiaraba. We actually um, studied 130 women, 35 of whom had endometriosis and 35 of them, um, sorry, 65 with endometriosis and 65 without endometriosis. We made a diagnosis of endometriosis based on their laparoscopic findings, findings at um, laparotomy, those who have histologic confirmation of endometriosis, or those who made significant improvement following treatment, empiric treatment for endometriosis related pain. We use a numerical rating scale to ascertain their pain score. Those women with a score of 0 to 5 were adjudged to have mild pain. Those 6 to 7 were graded as being moderate, and a score of 8 to 10 was considered to be severe pain. The genetic analysis was done using one of the newest techniques. We use Pac-Man assay for the genotyping, and we use TACPAD program master mixes on a quant studio five real-time polymerase chain reaction. Statistical analysis was done using SPSS graph path prism, and we also use upload view to construct the upload types. We used a uh, man with NIU to compare the differences in the serum interleukin concentration between the two groups studied and we did chi-square analysis and host ratio to ascertain if there is um, any significant difference in the um, in the allele frequencies, the minor allele frequencies. So our findings, as you can see from the table, there was significantly um, higher incidence of chronic pelvic pain, painful menstruation, painful sexual intercourse, blood in stool in women with endometriosis compared to women without endometriosis. Two thirds of women with endometriosis, uh, sorry, one third of women with endometriosis were found to have ascites in this study, and those women were mostly enrolled from the gynecological outpatient clinic because oftentimes they are referred to loot as cases of suspected ovarian cancer, whereas they are not cancerous cases. We also have a few cases of pleural effusion from the cardiothoracic clinic. This study did not find um, any familiar predisposition only 4.6% of the women studied had family history of endometriosis. We did not find any statistically significant difference in the interleukin 6 and 16 genes in women with endometriosis compared to women without endometriosis. One significant thing we found from this study was the fact that 
there was um, significantly higher interleukin 16 concentration in women with endometriosis who presented with severe pain compared to those who presented with mild pain. But this um, significance was lost when we compared those with moderate pain versus mild pain or moderate versus severe pain. Then we also found that in one of the SNFs, that is the single nucleotide polymorphism for interleukin 16 gene, the minor allele frequency was significantly higher in women with endometriosis. That was in the SNFs RS4778889. And this showed that the hubs of women with endometriosis having gene polymorphism in interleukin 16 gene was 80% higher than in women without endometriosis. These are just both plot to show the association, the serum interleukin concentration, much higher in those with severe pain compared to those with mild pain. And um, that's the p-value there, which was less than 0 0.025 when we look at the SNAPE RS4778889 of interleukin 16. Endometriosis is a gynecological condition that affects the immune system. And as we know, interleukin is a pro-inflammatory marker and also an autoimmune and immune modulator. And that was what actually ended our decision to see if there is an association with the symptoms women with endometriosis present with. Earlier studies have actually looked at the um, if there is um, any genetic polymorphism, and earlier findings have been conflicting. Our finding was quite similar to what was found in the Chinese population, even though, um, of course, as we are aware, there can be genetic um, variation from country to country or even within countries. Uh, the findings of this study actually um, I would say it's conclusive, but at least we not have um, good enough data to jumpstart the process to be able to do larger multicenter research in future. Considering the fact that there is an association between chronic pelvic pain, which is one of the most worrisome symptoms we manage in the clinic, and this interleukin gene, there is a good reason for us to explore in the near future this aspect of endometriosis. That brings me to the end of the presentation. But before I go, these are some of my references. This um, research was presented at the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist World Congress in June 2022, which held in the United Kingdom. And it was one of the top best Foreign abstract published in the BJOG supplement. You can actually access that online and you'll be able to go through the, the full abstract. It has been submitted to BMC Women's Health for publication and already undergoing peer review by my reviewers. We're expecting the feedback from them soon. Before I leave this podium, I want to thank the family of late barrister Frederick Kabimbola Ainomolumulele for this wonderful opportunity they've given to we junior faculties to conduct research. I also want to thank my mentors, Professor Oshuntoki and Professor Bosede Afolabi. Professor Bosede Afolabi is special to me because she has actually increased my interest in research so, so, so much that right now I have a lot of interest in genetic research and randomized control clinical trials. I also want to thank my co-investigators, Dr. Oyeshola Ojewumi, 
who is a geneticist, Dr. Chika Omwoma, also a geneticist at Naima, Dr. Ifoma Udenze, who is a lecturer at the Department of Chemical Pathology, University of Lagos. They were very nice people to have collaborated with. And finally, our new Vice Chancellor and the first female Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos, Professor Fola Shadi Obunshola, that's one name I cannot live here without making reference to. A Prince Grant made me who I am today in terms of research because it was through the Prince Grant I had the very first lecture on genomics that stimulated my interest in genetic research and she conducted a lot of workshops then which actually expanded my knowledge base in research. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Baba. You can see that you've made a fantastic use of the grant that is given to you. I believe one day we shall also be able to discover what is the causing fibroids in women through this grant that we receive as it is. Well, we will quickly move to the next one, which is a closing remark by Professor Ayadele Ashew Kanchewe. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it. Thank you very much, um, the chairman. I guess this time I am standing as myself. I'm not representing the vice chancellor. Uh, that's because Advancement Office, as well as Innovation in University of Lagos, actually I have oversight for those. And all I can say is that the lecture we have had today just further confirms that University of Lagos is in the right direction. One of the priorities of the university under the 25-year strategic plan is growing research, moving us out of being a teaching intensive university to becoming a research intensive university. It has been with a lot of pressure. Uh, guest speaker, you may want to know that um, some time ago, literally people were coerced, you know, to actually get on Google Scholar and, you know, uh, put their publications on Google Scholar. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the, in the future, uh, in the very, very, very near future, not too far future, because I know that the process and the uh, standards are being revisited, you will be required to indicate, you know, um, your index before you are able to go forward. Not because we wish to be wicked, but basically, we need as a university to respond to Nigeria's developmental needs. 1962, Nigeria's developmental needs was giving people the basic skills to immediately do the have to do. Universities were predominantly teaching intensive just to provide human resource for the newly independent state. Today, the need of Nigeria and indeed the need of Africa is research that drives change and development. Innovation is another main pillar. And uh, in the past, uh, in the last five years, only last year, we even separated our research management office from our innovation office to be able to develop capacity in providing support for innovation. And so I thought the challenge at us as faculty the bottom line is that the university, with the minimal resources that it has, is already driving us in the right direction. But we must 
within our smaller communities, departments, faculties, sit and develop our own strategy. Maybe our strategic plan as a department. How do we want to optimize this? Um, I know, for example, that um, right now, as we speak, the Department of Biomedical Engineering is running a boot camp for students, not just of biomedical engineering, but from everywhere. It, there was a call, and the students responded. And they are in the uh, innovation device innovation lab now, responding to some questions in the area of medical science. I know that the last time that the boot camp held, which was also during the strike, it was uh, they were responding to the needs of neonates. And you had Nigerian students drawn from physics, engineering, the core sciences, trying, using design thinking to begin to elicit. So we just need, and what we can do, now speaking as advancement, only last week, I was able to persuade an alumnus who veered from law into entrepreneurship to endow a word for business pitches. Not a word for best graduating student in business, but students do business pitches. Businesses that currently run in or businesses they want to run so that they can get some money to grow those businesses or translate the ideas into serious businesses. In the same way, we're talking to people who can provide the same kind of support for innovation. Only last, um, the last uh, final year, I know uh, that engineering students were invited to pitch their research, uh, their, their research outputs. And four of them won grants. Uh, uh, I think the first person got a grant of about 2.5 million to, try to further improve that and get it to prototype instead of just the proof of concept. So we need to speak to alumni, we need to speak to friends, we need to bring industry closer. And I just want to say thank you once again to the, um, the uh, Omolulu Molele family. I'm sure you are heartened, you are glad to see that the money you have given is producing results, not just in terms of enlightening the public, but you can see that certainly from the research that uh, the award, research grant award that was made and the output and uh, the fact that this is even globally renowned. So we implore you to do more if you can. We implore you to tell others about your good experience of the University of Lagos and show them the direction. We need to move our society rather than the amount of money we spend on funerals. If we could just put so half of the money we put in those funerals into research, into sometimes what cost those deaths, we will definitely be advancing our development. I say thank you very much, everyone who has come, and um, the University of Lagos cannot thank you enough. We promise that we will take draw lessons out of the paper that we have listened to rapidly today, and we will definitely fine tune the work that we are doing. Thank you. Another round of applause for Professor Ayodele Ashenua, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Development Services. I've always said that on an auspicious occasion, only one woman can create a sensation that the crowd will show appreciation by giving her a standing ovation. A round of applause for her. We move quickly and swiftly to the vote of thanks, and that will be done by the head department of obstetrics and gynecology and chairman planning committee, Professor Bosedi Akolabi, FMCOG. What that means, I will go and decipher. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Um, I had two great MCs here. Um, my work here today is the easiest one um, to thank people and um, just show gratitude for this um, wonderful occasion. I would like to thank the Vice Chancellor, represented by the DBC Development Services Professor Yadile 
Asenua, thank you for always being present and speaking the truth in your strong and formidable manner always. I'd like to thank the Provost, Professor Adewale Oke, for your constant and supportive nature, always being there. I'm thanking the Deputy Provost as well for your listening ear and for being present all the time. Our Chairman, my role model, <laughs> Professor Adeto um, Kumofabangu, thank you so much for your focused, fair, no-nonsense leadership. Um, I would now like to thank the guest speaker, Professor Friday Okunufa. What a lecture. Another round of applause, please. Thank you so much, sir. Professor Okunufa was my teacher. I remember him so much in Ife when we were there and how everybody revered him and how great um, a teacher he was. Thank you for your fantastic and inspiring lecture. You spoke the truth and we do need to look for more research. We need more research funds in the country, but we also need to know that the research funds, don't, they don't lost fall in your lap. You have to go and look for them. And you have to be ready to be rejected or to keep trying before you get them. Um, I thank the donor. I can't, um, uh, I mean, that should probably have even been the first. The donor, this amazing, deep thinking, visionary woman called uh, Mrs. Frederica Abimbola Amolulu Mulele for the foresight to do these wonderful things, to restore money. People don't tend to do that. As um, Professor Noah said, instead of you know, donating for funerals, people don't tend to think about putting money into academics and research. And this woman did that, among so many other things. I spent one year in Adrao <laughs> Memorial, so I actually feel related to her in that way. I thank that the family for helping to um, sustain and for helping to um, continue this vision, uh, represented by uh, Dr. Bola Jacqueline. Thank you so much for being here and the other members of the family here present. Thank you. Um, I thank the members of the board, headed by the board chairman, Professor Fola Shade who is um, currently unavoidably absent. I thank the Dean, Faculty of Clinical Sciences, every represented by Professor Olawale um, here. Uh, thank you for your support as always. I thank the Advancement Office, um, Mr. Dare, Mrs. Godfrey. We didn't even meet until today because of the, the, it's a new team, but um, we, uh, thank you for your support and for the hard work. It takes a lot to plan such a, uh, a, an event. Members of the planning committee in my department, Dr. Zola Mejulo, Okunowo, Makwe, Omishaki, Baba, um, Okunwade for their hard work. Um, Professor Anna Olu for supporting us from behind all the time. Um, I thank the departmental staff. I thank all the deans here present. Before I forget, I haven't forgotten that. All the deans here present um, and the heads of departments and the senior professors. I thank Professor Akiola for coming all the way and coming so early today. Um, I thank the departmental staff for the hard work, um, the attendees, uh, the senior nurses, DNS Oyegoki and Mapidom, I think you may be here, DDNS, the Massman and Alasi, and all your team, all the students here. I want you to give yourselves a very big round of applause. I'm very proud of you for being here, for coming. I'm sure you were selected to attend, and I'm sure you've got a very good um, rendition and you've got some good information. Some of you will do research, I'm sure, regardless of what field you go into. Um, I thank everyone. I apologize if I have not um, thanked you directly or personally or the college admin staff. I've almost forgot that. How could I have forgotten my, my DF and my deputy um, uh, uh, college secretary and my college secretary who I thought I'd added at the beginning, but I do apologize. Thank you very, very much for your attendance for being here, for coming for this um, event, and we hope that you'll be here and support us next year as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bosaidi Afolabi, fellow Medical College of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Manchester. I did his research now that we are doing now. I've been encouraged by Professor Konofwa. Professor Senwa, I'm promising you, ma. I'll pick a jam form and I'll study medicine. <laughs> hey, what God cannot do. Let me call on Dr. Batmos Kuye Ghanaian to help us with the closing prayer. And after the closing prayer, take the rendition of the national anthem of our dear country, Nigeria, and there will be group photographs. And we are done. Open, open.
We give all glory to Allah, we give all glory to God, we praise Him, we are adoring Him. We thank Him for making today a success, indeed it is. As for me, I thank God for making me um, a participant and an audience today because I've really been inspired. And on behalf of the um, organizers, the University at large, I thank God for making this um, lecture a success. We indeed are grateful. And we praise Almighty God to make our journey back home an easy one. We pray to Almighty God. We want to use this opportunity to pray for our lecturer for quick recovery and full recovery. We pray God strengthen him back and, and give him full recovery. Allahumma rabbana hatina fi dunya hasana wa fi lakhirat hasana wa wa kina zabana al-fatiha. Bismillahi rahman rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Al-Rahman rahim. Malik ya umidin. Iyya kana abduwa iyya kana stain. إِذِنَ الصُّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمَ صُرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Well, we thank our participants online. Quite a lot of them joined us online. Too numerous to mention. We say thank you for joining us online. Before we take the national anthem, I leave you students with the word of my late dad. You must make a choice to take a chance, or else your life would never change. On behalf of my humble self and Dr. Sunday Omishake that I've learned quite a lot from, I'd like to say thank you, adios amigos, gracias, obrigado, siabunga, danke, merci. Let's be upstanding for the national anthem.